hey, risk is tying yourself to one source of income because at any point that can be taken away without your input. Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of the Real Estate Investors Club podcast. I'm here with Matt Four, who's joining us from rainy Nashville. <laughs> um, Matt, just uh, by way of quick intro, tell me your role in your organization. Yeah, sure. So thanks for having me. I am a partner here at Next Level Income. Next Level Income is a private equity real estate syndication company, which just basically means we help individual investors invest in big commercial assets. Okay, great. Um, I also met Matt at uh, RubeCon. Actually, I think it's about 10, 10 days ago, a week ago now. And uh, he was the first first person I met at the conference. And we had such a great conversation. I was like, you need to come on the podcast. Um, and we're going to try to spin this a little bit so that a Canadian audience uh, can make sense of what you're saying. Um, but uh, I, guys, you're going to see Matt is, uh, is going to give us some good juicy tidbits this morning. So um, by way of introduction, why don't you just tell me a little bit about your journey through life that's led you to be on a real estate show today talking to me? Sure. So um, in my former career, I spent 15 years at technology companies at some of the largest technology companies in the world being in sales and sales leadership roles. And part of the good thing about sales, Terry, is like you get to earn your own paycheck. Basically, it's uh, when times are really good, you're going out to steak dinners. And when times are bad, you're asking their kids if they're going to eat their pizza crust because you want to eat something uh, that night. And so how I found real estate was I was working for a previous company and we landed a $10 million net new logo and my eyes were wide on the commission check that I was going to receive. And I remember I, I started looking through different ways to go invest this. I looked at stocks, crypto, bonds, and I had a mentor at the time that was like, you should look at this real estate stuff. Cash flows, appreciates, and here in the States, there's tremendous tax benefits to it. So I kind of went down that rabbit hole of learning about real estate, rich dad, poor dad, bigger pockets, all that sort of stuff. And then I got a call the week of Christmas from my VP at the time who said, Matt, you're not going to get that commission check. You're only going to get two cents on the dollar. And I remember asking, like, how did we come up with this number? Where did this come from, et cetera? And he asked me, how much money have you made this year? And I told him and he goes, well, isn't that enough? And it was at that point that I realized if I was going to give to the causes I cared about and pursue the things that I was passionate about in life, that I was going to have to chart my own financial path. So what uh, happened in December with that terrible news ended up on a good path for me, it, scratching an itch and a passion that I've always had, um, learning about all things real estate. So I guess I'll just stop there and take the conversation wherever you want to take it. That's one serious piece of bad news. You must have been really upset. Um, tell me how you bounced back from that and then did your first deal. Did you do your first deal on your own? Did you get involved with other people right away? What happened after? Yeah. So bouncing back, um, it was difficult, right? Um, anytime you see the amount of money that you think you can make and it's kind of taken away from you unjustly without your input at all in a surprised way, it's easy to be frustrated. But look, in my career, I got a lot of training. I learned about technology. I worked with some really, really phenomenal people. So I would never take that back. And ultimately, pain is just a lens and how you view your life can be, oh, woe is me. Or you can view it as a lens that propels you into something great like I found. So first deal was very quickly after that. I think it was four months after that. I bought a um, home that was built the year before. It had one resident beforehand. They were moving. I knew the area. It was right around the corner. It was a new build. There were going to be no issues. So that was my first property. It wasn't a home run property, but it got me started. And Terry, I think one thing to kind of emphasize here is I had a lot of people in my network that were like, isn't that risky? They saw what happened here in the States in 2008 to 2010 in the real estate market. They understood the idea of getting a good job and having a st steady income and things like that. And I remember telling them at the time, like, hey, risk is tying yourself to one source of income because at any point that can be taken away without your input. And two, if this property goes to zero, I will basically have spent the same amount of money I would have spent on an MBA here in the States. So I'm going to get more experience, more hands-on experience, learn financing, learn how to build a team, all those sorts of things. So I'm going to try this to see what happens. 
Yeah, I think that's like such a, a great point. And I want to kind of underline that, you know, like when I started out, um, you know, starting my real estate management comp company and started out as an investor, um, I had friends with like corporate jobs who were like, like, Terry, that's so risky. Like, how can you do that? I could never do that. And with a 10 year time horizon, I'm still working for the same, you know, employer who is me. I'm still doing the same things. I've never been fired. And when I look at, you know, the careers that my friends have had, like, sure, you know, corporate income can be can be nice and it makes the banks consider you in a, in a different way. But at the same time, like they've cycled through various jobs. They've, uh, you know, had to go go out, find new income, been unemployed for a while. And it's it's just funny to me that that gets billed as like the secure way to go where you don't actually really have control of your own income, right? Whereas like, you know, I, in a sense, I do control my own income, of course, like mar markets go up and down, but my tenants are never even with COVID going to all stop paying. And so that mm -hmm. revenue stream also, because it comes from multiple different directions, like you said, it's, it's, it's ironic that, that one thing gets billed as being safer when in fact, I don't know. Yeah. I, I mean, a quick comment on that is in the States, at least in 2020 to 2022, we printed money hand over fist and everybody got money in their bank accounts. Every business got money in their bank accounts. And there was this war of attrition of talent for W2 companies where people would job hop because they knew somebody could pay them more. And so the messaging seemed to be around, you know, we care about people and this is a great place to work and work friendly environment. Well, now in 2023, we're kind of going through a little tough times here in the state and economics are a little bit uncertain here. And now it's all about like you saw Twitter, Google, Facebook, Amazon, like all these bigger companies are laying off thousands of people, tens of thousands of people. And their stories like, hey, I tried to log into my computer today and I can't log in. My badge doesn't work to the office. What happened? And so it seems like the power dynamic has really shifted from hey, we're an employee first company to, oh, times are tough. We got to worry about the bottom line. So at the very least in entrepreneurship and investing in real estate, you can kind of take control of that yourself and you know it's on you. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and so tell me how you went from that first uh, property to then, you know, quitting your job and, and being a full-time syndicator. Like what did that trajectory look like? Sure. So we... Um, we, I started off in single family. I bought a turnkey that uh, produced some good stable income. I saw the power of uh, the appreciation that happens in the Nashville market here because it's a booming market. Um, so quickly started to gobble up more properties and then started doing everything from flips to burrs. Never wholesaled anything, but I bought frequently from wholesalers. And then I hit that limit of 10 properties. I had 10 properties in my name. And here in the States, after you get 10 properties, Fannie and Freddie won't lend you any more money. They, they, you fall out of their box. So all of a sudden I can't walk into JP Morgan or bank of America and ask for a loan. I've got to go to local credit unions or private money or something like that. And I was taking a pretty big step in my career around that time. And I also had two instances happen. I had an HVAC unit go out on one of my properties, which cost me about $5,000, which didn't, didn't, didn't crush me. I set aside money for that. I knew things like that were going to happen. But then I also had minor flood damage on another property, which was another $6,000. Again, didn't crush me, but wiped out my cash flow for the entire year. So I was running up against two different issues and kind of accelerating my career. So I just decided like, hey, I'm going to either have to source out alternative capital or I can look at different avenues. And that's where I ultimately found syndications Like you can buy into as an individual investor self-storage facilities, apartment complexes, mobile home parks, car washes, different things like that. So started building my passive income streams through being a limited partner. And then ultimately my partner and I decided to join forces and, and go put some of these bigger deals together. So today our, our portfolio, we have 4,000 multifamily units in the Southeast, 12 self-storage facilities, two dozen car washes and five mobile home parks. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll stop there and take it wherever you wanna go. Wow, uh, that's uh, quite a quite a progression. Sounds like uh, you guys managed to build quite a portfolio. Um, I I have two places I want to go with that. The first one is I want to hear about a deal because I know, like uh, you know us, I think for for Canadian invest investors, we 
um, don't have as much, you know, car wash, self storage uh, stuff as you guys do. I mean, the joke is always that like Canadians, like we just have less stuff, right? So hundred yes, <laughs> percent correct. <laughs> self storage is not such a big thing here. Mobile home parks are also not such a big thing here. Um, partly because like our campgrounds are like actually mostly government run and they have to do with like our national parks. Like we don't, and we don't really have, you know, trailer parks that people live in on a, on a permanent basis. Um, but maybe you can tell me just a little bit about what, what one of those deals might look like if somebody wanted to, um, you know, passively invest with you guys in like, you know, a car wash or a, a self-storage facility, what might that look like? Sure. So our strategies are different for different asset classes and different times and different markets. So I always kind of hate when people talk about what's the real estate market doing these days, because the real estate market is a trillion dollar industry. I mean, you can't just broad brain stroke it. You can't paint stroke it and, and say that. So I say that to say like each structure is different. Each opportunity is different. But in our car washes, for instance, what we've seen in the States is that it's a very fragmented industry. There's one company out there that's a publicly traded company. They're the largest company in the car wash space, and they own less than 5% of the market share. Wow. Whereas if you look at Google, for instance, and online ads, Google owns 50% market share, Amazon owns 40%, and then there's everybody else, right? There's these dominant players. So our thought process there is, hey, if we can buy some of these mom and pop operators who built these things in the 90s, built these things in the 2000s, have never really operated it like it's an institutional quality asset, fold it under a single brand, and then ultimately put a subscription model on it, then we can build a business that will demand a higher multiple than just trying to buy one car wash and flip it. And we've seen this across multiple different industries, right? It's not just we're trying something new here. Johnson & Johnson, P&G here in America are just these big conglomerates that own multiple different brands under one same heading. It's very, very similar. From a subscription model standpoint, we see um, companies like Adobe and Microsoft, they no longer sell you the product once, they sell it to you on a monthly income stream. Well. That helps us because we have reoccurring revenue when times are slow and Wall Street or bigger private equity firms love this idea of reoccurring revenue. So they'll value it at a higher EBITDA than multiple uh, than just a single uh, lump sum of cash. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that's kind of how we think about it and why we're why we're interested in that space. That's so interesting. So explain to me, how do you turn a car wash into a subscription model? Like that doesn't seem like, um, you know, it makes sense to me that like self storage would be like anything that pays you like a regular rent is specifically interesting because um, it's um, it's recurring revenue. But like the car wash, okay, so like you're you're turning those into I guess like franchises or something. How does that turn into a subscription model? Because that doesn't immediately make sense to me. Yeah, sure. So we offer like one-time washes. If you want to come wash your car, Terry, it's let's call it $9.99. But we know that you live within a three-mile geographic area. That's kind of our sweet spot that we're looking at is who's our target audience within three-mile area. You drive past it all the time. Car ownership in the States over the past three years has exploded. And anybody that buys a new car wants to keep it clean, wants to keep it fresh, wants to make sure it looks good because it's a new asset to them, a very expensive asset. So instead of doing the $9.99 car wash one time, why don't you pay $14.99 a month? And not only can you wash your car as many times as you want during that month, but you can also visit our other locations, which are in very similar geographic areas. So they might be 90 miles away. There might be one in the same town that's 10 miles away from the normal location that you would go or things like that. Um, and we sign them up through an app, basically. So we have our own app now that will provide uh, discounts to our customers and provide marketing information and things like that. Wow, that's a really, real. that's a very interesting thing. Uh, I, I would never think of anything like that. And so if I want to, you know, invest in that, what does that look like? If I'm like a passive investor, I have, you know, I, I've got my accreditation, I've got 100k I want to play with, what does that look like? Yeah. So in the States, it's for accredited investors only. Um, and that's an SEC regulation on what is an accredited, accredited investor and non-accredited investor. We can talk about that if, it, if, if you want. Um, but essentially, as a, as a limited partner in any of our real estate deals, you're just that. You are limited. So you will go through and underwrite us as operators, underwrite the deals. But ultimately, once you place your capital, 
you don't have to worry about anything from there. So we did have a, a minor hose break at one of our car wash facilities, which is a pretty big issue. You've got water flowing out. You've got to shut off the water, get it fixed. And if we don't get it fixed, I mean, that is our business. So we need to get that fixed pretty, pretty urgently. Um, but as a limited partner, you're never going to know about that. You're never going to hear about that. You're not going to have to fix it. And most importantly, when I talk to limited partners too, is there's no legal liability. We were talking a little bit at the conference around in the States, if you own any sorts of assets in the States, it's not a matter of if you're going to get sued, it's a matter of when. And even if you structure things appropriately, even if you're in the right and you did nothing wrong, it's a pain. You're going to have to go to dispositions. You're going to have to show up to court dates. You're going to have to hire lawyers, all those sorts of things. And it's just a drain on your time. So for a limited partner in one of our operations, you're going to see steady cash flow. You're going to see appreciation. You're going to see some tax benefits. And you're going to have none of the headaches of having to worry about the problems that go on on our properties or our facilities at any given moment or have any of the legal liability as well. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think some of that is is a bit similar um, to the Canadian context. We also have obviously like a securities commission, um, which I don't know the English acronym. It, in French, it's called the a IMF. Um, and like, you know, we definitely like in terms of how you pitch investments, um, it's one thing to pitch to accredited investors. It's, it's something different when you want to form partnerships with people basically from your circle because you can't be, um, you know, pitching to pitching to other people. What does that accreditation process look like just in like, you know, 30 seconds, Canadian person wants to invest in, in potentially in your business, uh, they need to form a US LLC. And then how do they go about becoming accredited? That's right. So quick legal disclaimer, uh, since you've been pitching, no, we're not pitching here. This is not me selling securities or trying to solicit it. It's just talking about different ways to invest in real estate. I'm just a guy on the internet that wears skinny jeans. Don't take my advice. Um, but in terms of accreditation, you're right. So uh, any kind of Canadian investor would need to form a US LLC. And the way the SEC defines accreditation in the States is that there's over $200,000 of uh, income over the past two years for single filers, $300,000 for joint filers, or a million dollar net worth minus your primary residency. So if you have a million dollars of net worth and you and it not including your primary residency, that can also qualify you as well. Okay. And then I guess you have to submit an application to, I guess it's the SEC or to who? Yeah, we have three different ways we do it internally. Um, so one, we can have a certified letter signed by your CPA on your income, a certified letter signed by your CPA on your net worth, or we offer a free service called Parallel Markets where you just go in, you log in, you fill out a questionnaire, and it does it on the back end. It does the verification on the back end. It's a service we pay for for our investors. Investors don't have to pay anything to go through that process. Okay, interesting. Have you really been listening to the episode or has your monkey mind been taking you off in one direction or another? Our mental habits can be our biggest assets or our biggest liabilities as we pursue certain goals. For me, the biggest performance gains have always come from training my mind. In my book, Mindful Landlord, I talk about how you can train your mind and how you can apply some of these strategies to your journey in the real estate field. The book is available on Amazon and also on its website, mindfullandlord.com. And now I'll stop evangelizing for the power of mental training and let you get back to the show. Um, anything else you want to tell me about your business and your business model before we get on to some kind of like more personal, like how you, how you develop through this? Um, no, I just think we're in an interesting time in the real estate market, specifically in the States here. Um, our portfolio is, is valued at over a billion dollars these days. And why I say that is to not boast, to not say anything other than when there's times of turmoil and a multifamily owner decides that they want to sell, they're going to call a broker and say, hey, I need to get this deal done. I just need to get it off my books. There's a debt payment coming up. There's some sort of compelling event that makes this happen. I want to make it smooth. I want to make it clean. And it has to be done by a specific date. If you're out there and you're saying, hey, real estate's in this weird time and I want to go buy these big apartment complexes, buy these big self-storage facilities, a broker is not going to take that deal to you first because they know that you don't have the track record, the relationships with capital markets, the relationships with Fannie and Freddie if you're going to do agency debt and things like that. Uh, we believe that we've built ourselves in a strategic position to take advantage of this kind of a market. We've proven through closing our deals, 
going full cycle with brokers and developing these relationships over the past nearly decade that we're going to be able to to make good plays during this time. So that's the only other thing I would highlight on our business model right now. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so let's uh, shift gears a little bit and talk about um, you know your personal experience of going through this. And I think you know one of my pet peeves, one of the things I always want to uh, bring out in this podcast is um, you know in the in in the Instagram world, um, it always looks like you know one minute you're flipping burgers, the next minute you're in private jets. And everything's happened like seamlessly and easily. Um, tell me a little bit about the lifestyle hits that you had to take to get where you are. Like, what did that, what sacrifices did you make? What kind of, you know, late night angsting did you do? What did the the flip side of that look like? Yeah, there's a couple things I would highlight here. We could take it wherever you want to take it. Um, one, I've never been on a private jet. Um one of the reasons I got into real estate is because I grew up in a very rural and poor town in America. Um, it's a area of the country where we've just left it behind. It's old coal mining town that now all of a sudden we've digitized and technology and we've globalized the world and people have forgotten about that. So I say that to say, I never grew up wanting nice cars, nice watches, nice house, nice boats, things like that. I just wanted to make sure I was safe and secure and that I could be intentional with the people that I cared about. So I'm in the process of editing my book right now where I really talk about the true ROI. It's not return on investment, it's return on intentionality. So are you spending the time and in being intentional with your actions? Um, in terms of hiccups along the way, I mean, I've had ton in the single family world. Um, I would say the biggest one was trying to do it all myself um, and not hiring quality property managers, not hiring quality people who had expertise and fixing and flipping and, and, and doing the things that needed to be done in a property. Cause that's certainly not me. Um, if you saw me swing a hammer, you'd never know if I was right-handed or left-handed, but I, I would say making sure you're hiring the right people around you that have the expertise and the knowledge to drive things forward. Another thing that I don't really talk about uh, too much, uh, in my story is that I had a sister with down syndrome pass. And I had a father who had triple bypass surgery all within the same 12 months. And so it happened right at the time that I lost that commission check. And right at the time, as I was starting to get involved in real estate and going back to my initial comment about pain, it actually helped me slingshot myself forward and realize what was important and realize that time was limited because of some of those things. Um, but those are definitely weren't easy times, weren't bright days in, in my life. Mm -hmm. Um, what about, you know, sacrifices that you made, um, when you decided to leave your job or, you know, late nights burning the midnight oil, like, what did that look like for you? I'll give you an example, you know, like for me, when I started, um, my portfolio, like I, you know, lived on the ground floor of a triplex in what was probably the worst, uh, one of the worst areas of, of Montreal at the time. Obviously, Canada is not dangerous like the States, but, you know, my friends were living in like nice condos with gyms in the building and like pools downstairs. And I'm like, yep, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm it's, it's called Hoshalaga. Like I'm living on the ground floor in Hoshalaga and like, you know, the junkies are and the, the prostitutes are my neighbors. Like <laughs> it's not dangerous, but they're like, hey, Terry, you know, <laughs> go earn my, uh, you know, my social social assistance check in the morning. <laughs> right. Um, so, I mean, were there, do you relate to any of that? Like what, what, what sacrifices did you make, um, to, to get where you are? So I don't know if it was sacrifices other than I did, I never got on the hedonic treadmill and the hedonic treadmill is essentially this concept of a luxury once, uh, experienced is a luxury that's always to be expected. So when I look back on pre real estate, I definitely traveled more. Um, I love to travel six continents, 40 some odd countries. Um, I still travel to this day, but I, I'm not traveling as frequently as I was then, which now I'm thinking about it. I probably need to make some adjustments there, but I, um, I never took the opportunity to upgrade my lifestyle. So all the way until 2018, I lived in the same townhome that I bought when I first graduated university. It was a $750 a month mortgage payment with HOA and I never upgraded from there. And I certainly could have, but I just never did. So I think like the sacrifices around compensation and money and things like that, I, I never really lived that lifestyle. 
So I didn't sacrifice too much other than there are parts of my life where I say, this is where I'm going to live an abundant life or I'm going to be rich in my life. And that's around health, fitness and things like that. But every other thing, I, I just never got into it, I guess. Yeah, I love that. And I, I, you know what, it's actually funny because the more I have these conversations, um, the more that's what I hear from people. And, you know, like for sure there is that like, you know, balling Instagram kind of aspect to the way, you know, a lot of real estate people pitch their image. But I think the truth is that there's also just a lot of people who are like, no, I'm going to, you know, set my ceiling of consumption a little bit lower. Um, you know, you use a hit, hit on adjustment, right? Like that once you, you, whatever you get, you cease to appreciate. And so if you just, you know, set your bar at a different level, set your consumption level, be like mindful about, okay, well, this, uh, specific investments going to bring me this kind of ROI, but like whatever else I take on, whatever sacrifices I make to build a bigger pile of stuff, um, that's going to have a, a health impact. That's going to have a time impact. And, you know, buying those new appliances, buying that new car, buying that fancy thing, like you're mortgaging some aspect of your life in order to be able to do that. And so I think, uh, I'm, uh, you know, interested to hear that, that you're, you're also sharing that experience. Yeah. I mean, as we're chatting, if people aren't watching this live, I'm wearing a hoodie and shorts I bought from Target. Like, and I'm a big <laughs> exerciser. I love to run and things like that. But my normal attire around the house is Target clothing and uh, <laughs> certainly love and appreciate Lululemon, but also it is not worth 10 times more than what I could buy at the, the local Target. <laughs> yeah. For, uh, those Canadians listening, uh, I also, when I go to the States, I, I like to go to target. We don't have it here. They got their sportswear is actually <laughs> can, can look good. And for a fraction of the price. Yeah. Yeah. It's like $15 <laughs> for a shirt versus going to Lulu where it's 80. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay. So just getting around to, I guess like our, our last question of the interview, cause we're uh, kind of coming up on the end of time. I like to ask people what, uh, should we be talking about in the real estate industry that we're not talking about? Um, what should be on our horizon? That's not on our horizon in the, you know, the conversations or the public discourse that you see. Um, first and foremost, I think I'm going to gear it towards personality is intentionality in your life. Um, I, to kind of steal some of your verbiage, when you get on the Instagram world or LinkedIn world, it's always like I, my AUM is this, this is how many doors I have and all that kind of stuff. And that's funny, but your, your wife or your husband hates you and your kids don't want to talk to you. Like that's not intentional. None of that means anything if you don't have that in your life. And a shared story uh, or story I'll share is I was at, um, son's soccer game or soccer practice, not a game practice. And I've got a friend there who's taking calls. He's texting back and forth. I'm like, what's going on? He's like, oh, I've got three rental properties. And one of them has going through some issues right now. And I'm adjusting with contractors and things like that. And I just kept being like, dude, your, your kid is looking up every now and then to see if you're paying attention, to see if you made that play, watched him make that play and things like that. And that's very, very important. So I would encourage everybody who's listening to really understand what do you want to be intentional in, in your life and make sure that you're doing the actions that lead you towards that intentionality. Uh, in terms of the real estate space, I think the next 18 months are going to be fun to watch, are going to be interesting to watch. A lot of uh, floating rate debt out there that had no interest rate cap that's going to be callable. Um, there's still supply shortage, so that I think will be interesting. But one thing I talk about a lot, and I'm not here to bash any specific market, but these tertiary markets where people move during COVID to go get more space, thinking that work from home was forever and things like that, I think they're going to get hurt. Markets like Nashville, where a thousand people are moving a day, tons of jobs and things like that, I think will be fine. But if you're in an area where um, all of the population growth over the past two or three years have been people working from home from these bigger California cities or uh, northeastern cities and things like that, it's going to be a tough go. So those are kind of the things that I, I would uh, watch out for over the next couple of months here. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's actually like super interesting because, you know, I, I occasionally talk to Americans then and compare it with what's going on in the Canadian context. And, um, you know, I, when I hear your assessment, I agree with it. Um, you know, in, in Canada, we're on a bit of a different trajectory. Like our, um, economy is just more like tied to real estate than the U S is. And so when the uh, government started tightening interest rates, which we did on the same trajectory as you guys, um, it really 
cooled the market down. It cooled everything down much faster. Um, and so like we've actually stopped tightening, whereas you guys are still like on the tightening cycle, your employment data, your market is more overheated than ours is. Um, and so it's definitely going to be interesting to like observe, you know, what, what happens with the U S economy versus, you know, what happens in Canada where we also have, um, you know, an incredible immigration plan. You know, we chatted about that a little bit at the, at the conference mm -hmm. over the weekend, but that, you know, our government is looking at adding, um, 500,000 new immigrants every year. And that is, uh, the same amount as the U S is going to be adding and we're one tenth of your size. So, uh, yeah. I think that's, that's definitely going to be interesting. And, uh, you know, I love your point about intentionality as well. I think you're right that, um, that's really not something that gets a lot of, you know, airtime or, or space in public discourse. And I think, um, you know, also at the conference that we went to at uh, RubeCon, that was definitely something that came up more often is, uh, you know, what what are your priorities and where is your, uh, you know, development and growth time going? So, yeah, That's thank right. you for that. Let, let me ask you, in the Canadian market, I think I understand that there's a lot more floating rate debt too, specifically on the residential side. I, any commentary around that? Yeah, so uh, you're absolutely right. Um, it tends to be more on single family. Um, and the investment space here is a little bit different in that like we don't have as much single family investing as you guys do in the US like our investors tend to be more uh you know kind of multifamily not big multifamily necessarily but like duplex triplex fourplex kind of things and single family tends to be owner occupied so uh and i think it's something like 30 or 40% of um mortgage borrowers here have floating rate mortgages um, and so that is it, part of the reason why, uh, you know, the pain from the fiscal tightening just immediately goes to the market. Um, and so, uh, you know, also because we have just more of our, 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 uh, economic activity is tied to real estate. It like the minute the government started tightening right away, everything adjusted downwards. Um, so, so I think, uh, you know, the, 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 we're just more sensitive to that kind of stuff because of the way our mortgage debt is structured. And because of the fact that like, you know, we didn't have 2008. And so that means that like, we didn't have really a correction and, and, uh, just the, the market's a little bit different. So. Yeah. So I would be watching that right now is what is, what are those interest rate? Cause I mean, for the first time in my life, I'm getting to experience in my adult life, getting to experience how interest rates really matter. Right. Because I graduated yeah. in 2008 from university when we dropped interest rates to zero and basically held them there for seven years. And then we had something in the States called the Fed tantrum where they raised it like, I don't know, 50 bips. And the market went crazy getting um, selling assets and devaluation and all that. So this is the first time where I'm seeing like, oh, wow, you 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 have five percent cost of capital, eight percent cost of capital. That starts to become a real big problem if you're uh banking on just straight up appreciation at 0% interest rates. Yeah, no, absolutely. And like deals that make sense, you know, for us at 2% interest, all of a sudden at 5% interest don't make sense anymore. And so right. you got to like wait, wait for that adjustment to like work itself through the system with like prices coming down and, and rents coming up or whatever else it is. Um, but we're just about running out of time. I want to, uh, Matt, thank you so much for spending this time with me this morning. Super interesting conversation. Like just like at uh, RubeCon, you know, I'm well, we could just go on talking for quite a bit longer. Um, so where, um, should our listeners look, look out for you or can they get in contact with you, learn more about what you do? Absolutely. So you can go to next level Uh, and on there, there'll be a copy to, uh, my calendar. There'll be a link to, um, click, uh, invest where we could connect. And there's also, we'll send you a copy of our free book as well. Just talking through demographic trends, why we like multifamily, all that sorts of stuff. So that's the best way to find us is at nextlevelincome.com. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you for tuning in guys.